Thank you all. Building our new kingdom won't be easy, but we will build it. A beautiful, bountiful kingdom where everyone can live happily ever after. I want you all to join me on this journey. The road ahead may be a long one, but at the end of it, there is hope! Nino Kuni 2 Revenant Kingdom is ambitious. It's a character-driven RPG that doubles as a kingdom simulator and even occasionally becomes a real-time strategy game. Though these components don't always feel like parts of the same whole, Nino Kuni 2 compels you to care and put your best foot forward. It's the whimsical setting. It's the demanding combat. It's the tangible feeling of growth that comes from being a well-rounded ruler. There's something worthwhile around every corner, and usually something pretty to admire along the way. Heaven, you mean to become king of this here world, is that not so? You can concisely summarize Nino Kuni 2 as the wholesome story of Evan, a boy prince ousted by traitors on the day of his coronation, who wishes to unite warring nations under a banner of peace. Armed with steadfast ideals, he repeatedly dismantles sinister adversaries because they too are actually good at heart, they've merely been corrupted by powerful dark forces. It's familiar fantasy fare, and a bit safe at times, but Nino Kuni 2 bears no shortage of interesting moments. For example, Evan's adult consul, Roland, is a dimension-tripping president from the modern day, cast into a strange time and place in the aftermath of a catastrophic military assault. While this intriguing origin story is rarely referenced after the fact, the kingdoms he and Evan visit offer up interesting qualities of their own. There's Goldpaw, a society that worships Lady Luck. Her divine power is channeled through a giant multi-armed statue that rolls a six-sided die to decide everything from criminal prosecution to raising or lowering taxes. You'll also have to navigate a kingdom monitored by an enormous, all-seeing eye, where love, in all forms, is considered a criminal offense. I will never understand why the people love you so, Leander. A weak, insipid man. But love you they do. Without you, I would be nothing. That is what they whisper, is it not? Nino Kuni 2 dedicates a lot of time to exploring these unusual societies, elevating the otherwise standard RPG tale to something far more interesting than you'd initially expect. To do this, however, the game is forced to concede that, occasionally, even a king as peaceful as Evan will have to bear arms. Considering his impassioned pleas for a world without war, the game's simple and infrequent RTS skirmishes, rock-paper-scissors battles that require resource management, feel notably contradictory. But standard battles are so flashy and exciting that you'll never think twice about the peace-loving king being in constant battle. Nino Kuni 2's combat takes place entirely in real time, apart from pausing to consume items. And despite the game's childish airs, fights are surprisingly demanding. Your party consists of three allies and four Higgledies, collectible, miniature, goofy familiars that randomly offer buffs and attacks during battle. You can only control a single person at a time, but that alone gives you three melee weapons to manage, a ranged weapon, magic skills to consider, and interlinked meters to monitor on top of defensive concerns. You need to be aware of your surroundings at all times in order to block or dodge incoming attacks, a far cry from the first Nino Kuni's turn-based battles. Needless to say, it can take a few hours to grow comfortable managing all these systems at once, but you're rarely put at a disadvantage. Your AI-controlled allies are good at self-preservation and dishing out damage, and your Higgledy friends regularly offer up bursts of healing magic or a powerful attack to keep things moving. While you can use gear to influence an individual character's strengths and weaknesses, you also earn a secondary type of experience that gets funneled into the Tactics Tweaker, a tool that lets you adjust team-wide attributes and how the game rewards your efforts. You have plenty of opportunities to take on quests underleveled, and being able to slightly dial up your effectiveness against a particular element or enemy type is a valuable means of punching above your weight. When pushing yourself against an enemy 10 to 20 levels higher than you, eking out a victory through clever preparation and a masterful performance can feel downright incredible. Given that you can find ways to overcome seemingly impossible odds, you can actually get by without grinding at all. To that end, the game is also designed to keep you from dulling your enthusiasm in unnecessary battles, as low-level enemies simply ignore you unless you run into them first. Knowing you can bypass trivial fights makes the prospect of exploring the world more enticing as the story carries on, and ensures that you're only focused on things worthy of your attention. It's easy to imagine how Nino Kuni 2 could get by in its quirky characters, engaging story, and real-time combat alone. But Evan isn't just trying to unite other nations. He's building a new kingdom of his own. 
From a humble castle nestled between mountains and shore, your lot of land will grow to contain dozens of buildings and facilities. While not the most complex management sim out there, anyone who wants to push the limits of their kingdom can easily pour a dozen hours into forging new developments and reaping greater financial and practical rewards. Everything in your kingdom takes money to fund and time to develop, but more than just investing in these services, you need to staff them with citizens from across the world. This means tackling a lot of side quests, acquired either by mingling with the populace or by completing tasks for the taskmaster. By and large, side quests are either a fetch quest or a kill X number of enemy bounty. These are common fare for RPGs, but nevertheless frustrating to see relied upon so heavily here. On the other hand, Nino Kuni 2's humorous writing and endearing NPCs shine through, lending something worthwhile to even the most common interactions. In fact, many of the people you meet in passing are far more interesting than the four human characters that ultimately join Evan and Roland on the ground. We have no rubberneckers here. You need the proper accreditation before I let you touch my bookie wookies, yes? For whatever reason, very little time is spent developing their stories after they enter the fold. But even if they offer little more than one-liners during most important events, they are at least invaluable allies in battle that introduce a healthy selection of skills. Then there is Lofty. who, while not a deep character, is the game's comic relief, and an endless source of amusement. With yellow skin, a pointy head, and a red torso, he's what you might imagine Lisa Simpson looks like if someone described her, but forgot to mention she's human. In almost every scene, be it serious or inconsequential, Lofty often lingers just off-center with a dim-witted stare. And when he speaks, he cuts through scenes with wry wit, and even regularly calls out the team for repeatedly tanking on errands and doing strangers' favors. He's a massive benefit to the overall experience, even within battle. He primarily wanders aimlessly during a fight, but on rare occasions offers a ball of light that causes a character to enter a temporary state where magic can be used freely. Nino Kuni 2 really wouldn't feel the same without Lofty. All right, uh -huh. wedding scene, take one, and action! Despite the fact that famed Japanese animation house Studio Ghibli isn't involved this time around, veteran artists from the studio have injected the sights and sounds of Nino Kuni 2 with distinctly recognizable whimsy, of which Lofty is but one example. You see it in the characters and environments at large, and you hear it in the soundtrack composed by Joe Hisaishi, a veteran of numerous Ghibli films and the original Nino Kuni soundtrack. The feeling is often upheld by a clean and colorful cartoon aesthetic, but there are also plenty of times when Nino Kuni 2 shifts into a different and far less appealing style. When exploring the world map, managing your kingdom, and diving into RTS skirmishes, the camera pulls back and everything is given a rough-hewn, super-deformed appearance. Though you can bend over backwards and call it a potentially necessary evil, that doesn't excuse the sinking feeling that there must have been a better way, one that doesn't require the game to hide its lovely cel-shaded face. Near the end of your journey, this shift rears its head during a battle that's intended to feel epic and intimidating, but instead falls flat due to the simple presentation and impersonal perspective. One last reminder that Nino Kuni 2, despite its outstanding qualities, bears some obvious flaws. Nino Kuni 2 is a robust game that offers ample ways to spend your time, and even if they aren't all up to the same level of quality, it's easy to appreciate how they collectively contribute to the bigger picture. It's chock full of exciting battles and surprising story moments that make for a far more memorable experience than you initially expect, leaving you impressed by your own accomplishments. If you didn't play the first game, don't let this one pass you by too. Let our nations be joined for the sake of the world. Let the banners of war ne'er again be unfurled. United we stand as one single land. 